So good evening, everyone. We are live on Zoom and on Facebook. We're going to give it about 30 seconds to let everyone in from the waiting room, and then we'll get started. For those who are fortunate enough to get in right at 7 o'clock, uh, if you'd like, no obligation, no pressure, but if you're comfortable doing so, uh, let us know in the chat where you're joining us from tonight. So type your, uh, your city, your, your home city, your town uh, into the chat. Let us know where you're viewing from tonight. Again, no obligation, no pressure, but if you're comfortable doing so, uh, go ahead and do that. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Oh, we already have questions. Look at this. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. All right. And folks are still coming in from the waiting room, but for out of respect for those that are here, we will get started. I just want to make sure we're live on Facebook. It looks like we are. Let's just confirm that. All right, we will get to the good stuff. Excellent. So good evening and thanks for being with us for the next hour. We're joined tonight by author Anna Malika Tubbs in conversation with Professor Tracy Parker for a discussion of Anna's wonderful, critically acclaimed new book, The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation. So we're gonna get ready to enjoy a fascinating exploration into the lives of three women ignored by history after raising sons who helped shape the civil rights movement. Uh, my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, before I disappear for the night, I wanted to just make four quick points. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes for making this event possible. This is a collaboration between several North of Boston libraries, uh, including the libraries in Andover, Bill Ricca, Chumpsford, Newton, North Andover, North Reading, and Tewksbury. I also want to thank Wellesley Books for being our bookstore partner, and I want to thank Anna's team for helping uh, make all of this possible. Uh, second, just know that this event is hopefully currently being live streamed on the Tewksbury Public Library's Facebook page. Uh, please give it a like and feel free to share the video. Uh, third, uh, for those who are registered for this program, uh, you'll be receiving a feedback survey uh, via email tomorrow morning. Uh, please let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Um, also in that feedback survey will be a link to purchase an autographed copy of The Three Mothers from Wellesley Books. And 10% uh, of each book sale will benefit the participating libraries tonight. And then finally, to set expectations, I anticipate this event lasting approximately an hour. Uh, Anna and Tracy will have a discussion. Uh, Tracy will essentially interview Anna for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, audience members should type their questions into the Q&A box. So try to put the comments in the comment box and the questions in the Q&A box. That will uh, help Tracy and I. And then Anna will then do a short reading, and uh, I'll wrap with just a very brief farewell. All right, so let me introduce Tracy and then Anna. Uh, Tracy Parker is an associate professor of Afro-American studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She holds a PhD in history from the University of Chicago. Tracy is the author of Department Stores and the Black Freedom Movement, Workers, Consumers, and Civil Rights, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. Uh, she is currently working on her second book, uh, entitled Beyond Loving, Black Love, Sex and Marriage in the 20th Century. Tracy's research has received support from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, among many others. Uh, she teaches courses on African-American women's history, 19th and 20th century US history, race and racism, class, labor, capitalism, and consumer culture. And just to raise the curtain a little bit, um, we uh, had our, our original uh, moderator uh, had, a, had a conflict last minute, and Tracy is doing all of this and read the book on about five days notice. So we really appreciate it, Tracy. Uh, and now 
Uh, certainly, um, last but not least, let me introduce Anna. Uh, Anna Malika Tubbs is a Cambridge PhD candidate in sociology and a Bill and Melinda Gates Cambridge scholar. After graduating Pi Beta Kappa from Stanford University with a bachelor's degree in anthropology, Anna received a master's degree from the University of Cambridge in multidisciplinary gender studies. Outside of the academy, she is an educator, a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant, and the first partner of Stockton, California. Anna lives with her husband, Michael Tubbs, who is the mayor of Stockton, and their son, Michael. So let's all give a big virtual round of applause to Tracy and Anna for joining us here tonight. And Tracy and Anna, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, Anna. This has been a pleasure. Even with five days notice, I really enjoyed the book. So I'm excited um, to participate in what I hope to be a very engaging conversation about three mothers. Thank you, um, Tracy. Thank you for taking the time. Seriously, you're no so problem. busy <laughs> to do that within five days. is really amazing. So I appreciate it. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. I have to say, I was really struck immediately by the opening of mm -hmm. your book. It's so extremely personal. Um, and it's, for those of you who haven't read it, it, she details the moment in which you learn that you're becoming a mother. Um, yeah. And so I was hoping that we could start off by, you could speak about what initially brought you to the topic and how becoming a mother shaped the nature and direction of this book. Absolutely. And it's quite interesting because I started the research when I started my PhD program. So before I was expecting my son, I've always had this reverence for mothers, maybe because my own mom is very strong and very influential in my life and always really painted a picture for me of the importance of highlighting women's stories and thinking about those who have been forgotten. And in her own work as a lawyer, she advocates for women and children's rights, not only in the US, but also abroad. So I grew up with this kind of example that definitely was persuasive in my life. Um, and I also, in my own personal experience of having been the first partner of Stockton for four years, he's no longer the mayor, actually. Um, so that is a little bit out of date, but very recently, this was a change for us. Um, I also experienced erasure firsthand, what it meant to be associated with somebody who had kind of the spotlight on them and how you become erased, especially if you're a young woman and a young woman of color. But I also witnessed that in his mother's story. So I went into my PhD with a lot of different inspirations. I also had recently read Margot Lee Shetterly's Hidden Figures and seen the film. And I knew I just wanted to be somebody who was joining other scholars in correcting the erasure of Black women's stories. That that was gonna be how I spent my time in the academy, becoming somebody else who found other hidden figures. And that left obviously so many people, all of our, many of our stories as black women are erased, unrecognized. Um, we're not given credit for the things that we do day in and day out. And then I paired that with my respect of motherhood. And so in the middle of doing this research and I decided on these three incredible women, Alberta King, Burtis Baldwin and Louise Little for several reasons, but one of them being a more technical one, they were all born within six years of each other and their famous sons were all born within five years of each other. So even from this kind of sociology perspective, I could talk about their lives and the intersections that brought them together through history and through chronology, which allowed me to say, okay, I can tie these three stories together while celebra celebrating the beautiful diversity and nuance of their stories. So that is how I settled on the three of them. But in the middle of this research, <laughs> I found myself expecting my son. I didn't know he was going to be a boy. We left it a surprise till the end, but I kind of had a feeling. I said, this is going to be funny. I'm writing this book about the mothers of sons. We'll see if this is a boy or not. Um, and immediately felt, you know, I already had this respect for these three women. I was already in many ways kind of falling in love with their stories and feeling frustrated every day that people didn't know them already. They were so important in their own right long before their sons were born what they cared about, what they were passionate about, what they, you know, how they created life beyond giving birth to children, what they were doing with their art, with their activism, with their creativity. Um, and then also that they mattered so much to their son's 
journeys and to what their sons were able to do for the world. So I was so excited in the middle of this project to continue to let the world know. And my husband and I started trying for a child. And so it was just really special um, that day that I knew I was kind of holding the test in my hands as I talk about in the book and it said pregnant. But I also had to contend with the fears that come with motherhood and Black motherhood very specifically. I think this is a universal experience for moms that you care so deeply about your children, but you also have this fear constantly that something could happen to them, that something might happen to them, you know, and I realized quickly what my mom had always <laughs> talked to me about, you know, check in with me. Are you getting on your flight? Are you safe? I'm like, mom, you're thousands of miles away. Why do you care? <laughs> I now understand that feeling so much more profoundly. And the fact, though, that for Black women, these fears are heightened, and for many reasons, one of them being the Black maternal health crisis, that four times, we're more, four times more likely to pass away in childbirth or pregnancy than our white counterparts in the United States, whether or not we're educated, whether or not we have access to different levels of resources. So this is a really terrifying thing. And then beyond surviving pregnancy and childbirth, we're also afraid constantly of the tax that are waged against us and against our children. So to summarize this answer, I felt even more connected to the three mothers. I felt that I could take inspiration from them. I remembered that I had agency, that there was nothing that I had to accept as an inevitable burden that I was going to carry as a black mother. But instead I was joining a legacy of change makers who used their motherhood as a growth in their own activism, as building on their passions and thinking of things that I'd always advocated for, but now I had another reason even more so um, to continue to speak up and speak out against the ways in which my, in which my community was being hurt, was being silenced, and was being oppressed. Thank you. The three mothers you speak about, Alberta, Louise, and Verdice, are simultaneously ordinary and extraordinary, right? These are women who raise three revolutionaries that go on to change the nature of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, can you speak a bit about their lives and can you speak about what you think helped them or push them along in creating these three incredible men? It's almost, you know, again, they probably didn't plan for that to happen as much as they, you know, were pushing their children, all of their children to be change makers. Something that brought the three mothers together was that although they had different approaches to this, they made sure that all of their children were well aware of what was happening, not only in the country, but in the world in terms of Jim Crow reigning supreme and this kind of white supremacist violence that was happening globally. But they also made sure with that education that they told their children that this does not define you, this does not limit you, that instead you're going to kind of join me, your mother, in the change that we're going to create in pushing these systems to see us as the human beings who we are with the worth and the value and the dignity and the respect that we deserve. And so in many ways that is both ordinary in a Black mother's experience, as well as extraordinary, because it is revolutionary to go against something in a whole entire system, a whole entire country that is telling you day in and day out, you are less than human. This dehumanizing treatment is what I'm kind of attacking throughout the entire book. And so that's what allows them to focus on the future. They are the change makers because they visualize a future and a world that's not quite readily available to us quite yet, but they have to push their community and these systems around them to, to finally take that vision up and um, respect them and respect their children. So I think that's how they create these revolutionary beings and they did so in very different ways. So just to give some background for those who haven't read the book, we'll go just kind of briefly through each woman. Alberta was born to two parents who were the leaders of Ebenezer Baptist Church. They believed wholeheartedly that faith could not be faith without social justice, that if you were going to call yourself a religious leader, you had to fight for rights of everybody, the poor, the oppressed, even if you were privileged, you used those privileges for something much larger than yourself to advance the movement forward. And so Alberta grew up attending marches and participating in boycotts. And her parents were some of the first members of the NAACP. She went on to become a member of the NAACP. So although she doesn't use the word nonviolence, you know, before her son makes this a more famous term, 
it's the same strategies that she believes this is how we create change. This is how we push our Black freedom movement forward. Um, Burtis Baldwin, she was born in a tiny place, Deal Island, Maryland, where she was born to quite a tragic situation. She lost her mother very early on in her first days of life. It could have even been in childbirth. All I know is that her mother's death certificate has the same month and the same year that Burtis is born um, and that she passed away from hemorrhaging. So in this really dark moment and dark beginning to life, she becomes somebody who focuses on light and focuses on how do you find forgiveness? How do you move forward without holding on to hatred? How do you confront the pain but find healing? How do you move through that? And she herself was a writer. So everybody who knew her said she wrote these beautiful letters. She could help you change your perspective on how you saw what you were going through, as well as what was happening in the nation with this kind of racial violence. And so she uses her writing to transform the minds of people around her, which I find to be, again, so beautiful and teaches her children how to do the same thing. And then Louise Little, she was born in Grenada and her grandparents were very important in her life. They are what we now call liberated Africans, which means that at some point they were enslaved and then with laws changing, they were able to gain their freedoms. So they felt very strongly about the importance of professing black independence Black pride, making sure that you don't depend on your oppressor. And so they taught their children and grandchildren how to plant their own food and hunt their own food and even build their own homes. So Louise Little grows up believing Black independence is key. Anti-assimilation to your white oppressor is very important. And she becomes a radical activist in the Marcus Garvey movement, the Pan-Africanist movement where she leaves Grenada and joins this international movement in Montreal, Canada first, and then later travels around the United States with her husband, spreading the message of Garveyism. So very different and unique strategies, but similar in their approach to saying, this is what's happening, and this is how we all need to play a part in changing it. One of the other things that I love about the book is not simply just your focus on motherhood and the way in which these women were combating racism. Um, throughout their lives, but also you show how they're also constrained by their gender. And so could you speak a bit about how your work broadens our historical understanding of Black womanhood? Absolutely. It's something that, you know, we call it all the time in our own studies, intersectionality, and a lot of people don't fully understand what we mean by intersectionality. It's not necessarily saying, you know, lots of, I mean, it's the term that's really been taken by many, and it's unfortunate because it's, it's lost its meaning because of that, where people say now, oh, it's that we all have different identities, meaning, you know, I have my gender, and I have my race, and I have my sex, and I have my sexuality, and all of those things come together in these kind of, you know, um, these identities that are inextricable from each other. But in reality, intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw to speak about the overlapping um, systems that put people at disadvantage. And so you see intersectionality at play very clearly in Alberta, Burtis, and Louise's lives, where it's not only race that is limiting them, it's also gender. It's also the fact that they are Black women, and all three of them are going to experience things a little differently because Alberta, for instance, has more access to education than the other two do. She has more access to communal support. She has more access to money. Um, and so I'm trying really, really hard to make sure people understand the different systems that are at play, because unfortunately, I feel that even right now in the US, many people do not understand how these overlapping systems are, are hurting people uniquely. We have a fear of admitting that, a fear of thinking about privilege in different ways. Um, and this book is sort of a welcoming to those who want an introduction to Black feminist thought. It's kind of a, I would say, very readable. Um, I think some people are afraid because it's part of my dissertation <laughs> that it may seem very academic. But in fact, this is a completely different document from my dissertation. This is a book where I intentionally wanted people to feel that it was accessible and that they could start to understand some of these terms that we use that are really not all that confusing, but when you now add a narrative and a personal perspective to it, it makes a lot more sense what that theory means. Yeah. I think I was really struck by the way in which not only these women shape their sons, but also when they're absent, right? What their absence might do to their sons. So I'm thinking specifically mm. of Louise. Yeah. Um, and so 
she spends some time in a state institution after her husband dies. Yeah. Her children are then taken from her and placed into foster homes, including Malcolm X himself. And he details some of this in his own autobiography. But what I was most struck by is there's a quote you have on page 165 that I'll just briefly read, um, where you quote him as he's talking to Alex Haley, who helped him write his autobiography. And he describes his emotions prior to his mother's release from the state institution where he says, quote, ever since we discussed my mother, I've been thinking about her. I realized that I had blocked, out, blocked her out of my mind. It was just unpleasant to think about having her about her having some 20-some 20, 20 years in, the, in that mental hospital. I simply didn't feel the problem could be solved, so I had shut it out. I had built up subconscious defenses. I was hoping maybe you could speak a bit about what separation um, does between a mother and a child, or at least maybe just specifically about this instance with Malcolm X. And it's a really important question to ask and to give some additional context into why Louise was taken from her children, because as much as Malcolm X did detail it somewhat uh, with Alex Haley, unfortunately, this moment's really been reduced. Um, and if we have heard of Louise, we've heard that she quote unquote went crazy um, mm -hmm. and how sad it is that this happened and then her children were taken away from her. But in reality, when we go back and see the very intentional steps that were taken to remove Louise's children from her, this is something that's much more complex than saying somebody went crazy, which already is very dehumanizing and reductive of a person's narrative. But with Louise Little, as I said before, she was a radical activist. And so she was very outspoken, very maybe afraid, but used her fear to do something courageous. Um, and when her husband was murdered, she was definitely experiencing depression. You know, of course, that's going to be awful for her, but it's also a part of a continuation of racist attacks against her family. And so she's acting a little differently. Of course, she's mourning. She's trying to figure things out, trying to support her eight children alone. And she starts to feel very upset about welfare workers making her feel like she's not adequate enough to be her children's mother. And they're telling her, you know, you're, you're not doing well, you know, Malcolm is shoplifting. Um, and they even pull some of the kids aside and start telling them, your mother's unwell, she's acting a little bit crazy. Are you worried? Are you afraid to be here? Blah, blah, blah. The children are very young, so they're not even sure what's going on. They, these welfare workers call her resistant. Um, and she feels like she's being disrespected in her own home. Again, she's a proud Garveyite. She's gonna speak up against this kind of treatment. And so a white male doctor is called to her house to diagnose her, to see what's going on. And he says, among many other very judgmental things, one of them is that she's quote unquote, imagining being discriminated against. So this white male doctor can say about a black woman, a black immigrant woman, that she's imagining being discriminated against. And this is enough to diagnose her with dementia praecox and put her away from her children for 25 years of her life. And so this separation is not only awful and really an attack on this family, but it's something that confuses the children for a long time because they're very young. And so with Malcolm X, you know, he's used to coming back to his activist parents. He's used to coming back to Earl and Louise who teach them every single day of their value as black people and tell them about this global movement that they're all a part of. These fam this family was very intentional in terms of passing on their knowledge of self-sufficiency. They all knew how to hunt. They, they would learn how to grow their own food, just like Louise did. She was trilingual, so she taught them to speak different languages. So this is the kind of education they have at the home. When she's removed from him, Malcolm goes now through this phase where he starts to try to, you know, seek attention other places. He really misses his mother and is in denial of the fact of what's happened to her. And so he even forms this kind of weird understanding of women in organizing. And we know that he was a little problematic when it came to feminism um, and things that he was quoted saying about women. But we also see a transformation in his mind that takes place later when he starts to understand, he says something in this autobiography where he says, 
that moment when they started to attack my mother and attack the image of my mother is when our family was being torn apart. And he says, I love my mother. There was no reason I should have been taken away from my mother. And it's also around the time where he starts to say the black woman is the most disrespected person in America mm -hmm. because he's starting to understand she was attacked. This was part of something larger. The thing that I'm speaking up against, my mother was a victim of this as well. And he sees his conversion to the nation of Islam as a return to her. And he says this in a letter, mom taught us this. She was the first to teach us this. All of our you know, accomplishments are hers. We owe this to her. And so the separation causes, like I said, some pain, it causes confusion. But I would say, fortunately, Malcolm X has this realization where he starts to see it as part of, part of this larger system. Um, and he's realizing, again, it's not just this racist attack. There's other things at play. And my mother was a victim of this. Um, and so even in that absence, he finds a homecoming to her, which I find to be really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think it's, that's one of many stories to me that you tell among, about these three families that really push against and challenge that narrative that we keep hearing about the black family as something that has been historically dysfunctional mm -hmm. as a result of slavery, right? This pushes against these notions of the Moynihan Report that came out in the 1960s under Lyndon B. Johnson's administration. Yeah. Um, and it really tells us about the resilience and the centrality of the black woman in the black family. And yet we know it's so central, right? And you're so brilliant about pulling that out. Um, I, I'm curious as to challenges you met in trying to research and write about these three women. It was so hard. This was such a difficult project. And that's why I say really early in the book, there are limitations to this. I want people to see this as our beginning in terms of our introduction to these three women and not the be all end all of their three stories. Because for instance, with the sons, there's dozens of things written about them every year, which is wonderful. I mean, it's really incredible, I would say, for scholars who are still like, I have something new to say, <laughs> you know, because even when I was writing this, I'm thinking, okay, am I going to say something unique? Am I going to say something important? Um, so to be one of the first to talk about these three women and still feel that way, I find it incredible that we still think there's a lot more to say about the men. Um, but I think the women should be treated in the same way, that we should have various different perspectives from which we study them. We should look for more evidence of their lives. And so one of the kind of, I mean, I've been spoiled by great reviews for this book, I should say, but one of the few critiques I received is like, why isn't there more about the women? Because there's, they weren't taken care of. Their stories weren't taken care of. The evidence of their lives is so scarce and so few people are asking for it that it's really difficult to find evidence, to find anything that speaks to them, especially in the right context. So if I find something about Louise that simply says she went crazy, that's not, that's, I can't really necessarily use that. There's so much more to that story and I need to go back and really dig and figure out the context in which this happened. And so I, I often say it was like finding needles and haystacks and even each paragraph in the book is five different sources that I have to piece together to make a story make sense. Um, or to give an example, for instance, with Burtis Baldwin, she didn't appear on any census data. And so I couldn't really like track her specifically, but I did know that she, at some point, James Baldwin says the only mother she knew was her sister, her older sister, Beulah. I was able with a local historian in, in Deal Island to track Beulah on census data. So therefore I could now track Burtis. Then I call one of her daughters um, and they were so gracious with their time with me. And I asked, you know, I can't take this for granted. Was she educated? I have, you know, I have no idea. I'm sorry if that's an insensitive question. And she goes, you know, I have no idea where, but she was clearly educated. My mom had this brilliant mind and power over language. And so I call the local historian back and I say, if she was educated, where, where would she maybe have gone to school? And he says, well, there was only one school for colored students at the time. So this was the school where Burtis would have gone. So this is what it took for me to say, okay, I had to keep calling and going back and forth and finding different evidence. And the final point I'll make about that, I was recently in a, a great um, discussion with a scholar at the Schomburg and he'd written a book about Malcolm X, the philosophy of Malcolm X. And we had this question about the research process. And he said, I was inundated. You know, I had so many different sources that I had to kind of limit 
which ones I was going to read because there's just so much out there. And I was on the opposite side of the spectrum. I was like, whatever I can find, you know, please just share it with me. And I was fortunate to have different scholars who helped me find, you know, any kind of archives, but also filling in the blanks with historical context. And that's really why the story became more than a biography because it had to, I had to fill in blanks so that we understood if we couldn't know about the three women specifically, we could know something about their contemporaries or what was happening. And we could spend some time even imagining how we might fill those blanks. But I do really hope it's not the end. I hope we find more. And I hope this is just kind of a welcome to many more people to say, these are interesting women. And if we want to know more, help me find more information about them. Yeah, thank you. Was there anything that surprised you while you were researching this book? The biggest surprise when I started it, I really was just interested in telling their stories. I had no idea and wasn't at all invested in proving that they were crucial to like this, the son's works. I wasn't trying to write a book about the sons through the mothers. I really just wanted to say, regardless of whatever the moms did, this is interesting. Their lives are worth studying. That was what I was invested in. What was shocking to me was how obvious the connections were between the moms and the mm -hmm. sons, which made the erasure that much more painful and that much more intentional because you really can't know these three men without knowing their mothers. And so how have we <laughs> been so amazed by these sons and so in love with them and still left the mothers out of the story? So again, for context with everybody who hasn't read the book yet, we have a radical activist who believes in black pride, black independence, Louise Little. Malcolm X, <laughs> black pride, black independence, anti-white assimilation. It's like it can't it almost can't get more direct than that. We have Burtis Baldwin, a writer who believes in confronting the darkness to find light and to find love. Her son becomes one of the most famous writers in history and calls himself a witness to the power of light. Then we have Alberta King, who believes faith cannot be faith without social justice, and that you meet the needs of the oppressed and the poor, that we are all connected. You use your education to advance something forward. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., it's, it's almost like, how, how were they erased? And that is the part that I am so critical of in history. But somebody recently sent me an article, it was something about Wikipedia and how like 90% of the facts written on Wikipedia are written by men. Mm -hmm. And probably most of them white men. Um, and this is similar in terms of facts around biographies and who is writing our biographies. And so it's very common in a patriarchal society, if you believe men are the stars of the show, you're gonna keep telling that story. So even if the son that themselves says, my mother taught me this. This came from my mom. Even James Baldwin saying, when I die, I want my mom to be buried next to me because his mom outlived her. And he even says, you know, when people come and visit me and honor me, I want them to honor my mother. You can't honor me without honoring her. Yet the story we've been told over and over again is solely about his abusive stepfather. So we have to question who told the story and Honestly, I don't think my idea was all that creative. People keep saying you were so creative to come up with this. No, I'm just a black woman and now I'm a black mother. And so I'm searching for my story as well. And unfortunately, if there's not many of us who are writing from this perspective, we just don't hear the side of the story. And it's really, it should be upsetting to all of us. And we need to question who the storytellers are and why we're reproducing the notion that men are the stars of the show. I think we're at a moment too right now, right? So in the historical record, it seems that Black women are invisible unless they're being condemned, commodified, or exploited in some way, right? But we're also at a particular moment right now with this current phase of the Black freedom movement and Black Lives Matter, where mothers seem to be on center stage and they seem to have this new public gaze um, on them. And I was thinking very much about Black Lives Matter as I was reading the book, but particularly when I was reading the chapter Losing Our Sons. Um, and when you speak about the assassinations of Ma Malcolm X on February 21st, 1965, and Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th, 1968. Um, and I thought maybe you could speak a bit, since we're wrapping up in a couple of minutes now, 
about the role of Black mothers in the civil rights movement and BLM and what lessons and legacies of Alberta and Virginia and Louise that we should be keeping in mind moving forward. Yeah. Something that I will say is while there is a little bit more of a focus on Black motherhood, it's unfortunately been so reduced to solely seeing us in our grief. And this was something I really wanted to avoid in this book. We are not only important when we're in pain and we are not, as Melissa Harris Perry says, Black women are not solely this conquered victim um, where we all just kind of say, oh, it's so sad that Black women have to deal with loss over and over again. And unfortunately, the fact that the mothers of the civil rights movement and the mothers of the movement now um, are only the mothers of those who have been slain and who have been taken from us. And that I find to be really a strange obsession, American obsession with Black women's pain, and also only congratulating us by making it through these painful moments and being celebrated for this as people say, superhuman strength and resilience. That is another form of dehumanization. We are not being seen in our wholeness. We are not being seen in our complexity. And this book takes things a step further and says, of course, we have to acknowledge the strength of these three women and the mothers of the movement now and how they are pushing forward. It's important for us to understand the ways in which not only they're surviving, but also how they're thriving, how they're finding joy, how they're finding life, how many of us each day in day out are revolutionary women and revolutionary mothers because we're continuing to bring life in our many different ways, like I said at the beginning, in terms of not only raising children and nourishing our communities and educating our communities, but also being happy and finding joy and not accepting the circumstances around us. So I would say 100% mothers are crucial. They always have been they always will be. And I want the focus to be something that's much more accurate. And also one that turns an admiration of our pain, a very strange admiration of our pain into action that says, okay, we acknowledge how much black women have done for this country. We see what happened in Georgia. We see how incredible it is that Vice President Kamala Harris is bringing our issues to the forefront. How do we now make things easier for Black women? How do we make sure that there are policies in place that protect them, that recognize them, that support them? We even see it with the pandemic. Apparently, women of color, as we all, as we knew already, don't have nets in place to catch them. Why is it that our country is built in a way where women of color are forced to choose if they're going to parent or if they're going to work? that's there's something wrong and there's something broken there and so instead of saying wow they're so strong look at all the attacks that they're able to fight against now let's also recognize what can change there's very tangible policies that i speak about in the book um, that i think are crucial that we move from this kind of admiration of black women's pain to changing circumstances thank you i want to now open it up to questions from the audience um, oh, uh, we have one comment already, um, and I will, I will read it, Kiana. Um, it's not a question, but um, Emily, if I'm saying the name correctly, writes, I have two sons and I'm about to have a third. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love what you said. We don't all only matter when we're in pain. I appreciate you and I'm buying your book tonight. Oh, I love your focus you. on our joy and how we're thriving. Love, 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 love. Oh, thank you so yeah. much. I have a baby on the way too, so we're both expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know whether it was a girl or a boy this time? We Can leave I it ask? a surprise. We, it's so much fun, I think, to do it that way. <laughs> it's true. There's not many surprises left in life. So Everyone that gets so well. frustrated by it, and my partner and I are just, we love it. While we're waiting for other questions, I have, a, I have another question. I noticed that all of your chapters start with quotes. Yeah. And they're quotes that don't necessarily complement each other. Yeah. Um, can you speak about your, that artistic choice? Yeah, the strategy behind that, and I love when people pick up on it because it definitely makes you feel sort of like it shocks you, like you're not expecting that. Um, but because I'm addressing dehumanizing treatment that Black women have faced and the ways in which we have fought that and said, no matter these attacks, we claim our humanity, we create life, we you know, our pushing systems in terms of bringing our vision to reality for this country. I wanted to, in each chapter, remind the reader of this kind of dehumanization, because 
I think people don't fully understand how black women are continuing to be dehumanized even to this day. And they may think if I say I'm treated as less than human that I'm exaggerating or that I'm just being dramatic. The reality is in all of these decades that the women lived and we still see it to, to, to now in terms of representations of black women, this is dehumanizing. And so I define dehumanization in the first chapter and then in, at the beginning of each chapter explain how here's a quote that somebody would have held in terms of like an idea that someone would have held against a black woman um, <clears throat> that was a kind of normal idea to hold, but that clearly displays that they thought that she was less than human and that they would treat her that way. Um, and then also a quote that, you know, kind of takes that same quote down and speaks to how we are human and how we're fighting for change and fighting to be recognized in our full humanity. And some of the quotes, I mean, I, Maybe sometimes they were harder to find, but for the most part, it was pretty easy to find those quotes that dehumanize Black women. So it further proved the point. I just sort of had to search like, okay, you know, like crazy things someone would have said in the past about a Black woman. And then there's a ton of stuff that shows up and um, it just made making that point a little easier. Yeah. So we have another question from the audience. Um, can you be specific with regard to the actions we can take in order to better support Black women and therefore Black families? Yes, definitely. So some of the policies that I address in the conclusion, um, I kind of break it down depending on our different identities, because I think we all have different roles to play um, depending on where we're coming from, who we are. <laughs> Um, I first speak to other Black women saying it's really crucial that we not allow erasure of our lives to happen, that we say I deserve credit for what I'm doing and my contributions, even in <clears throat> our own families and in raising our children, it's important that they see our humanity and see our vulnerability. We are not these like magical minions that are just making everything happen on our own. Because unfortunately, when we're seen that way, it again, further suggests that we are either less than human or more than human. And we are neither. We are human beings who deserve support, who deserve recognition. So a part of it, personally, there are things that we can do as Black women um, where we reclaim our narrative and continue to say, I am here, see me in my wholeness. Um, and also that we don't take up this kind of strong Black woman trope where we can do it all on our own. I, can, I think that that can be really dangerous. I then address our community where it's important for us to recognize that domestic violence is extremely high in our Black community. Um, there are many who say they love us, who are hurting us day in and day out, not supporting us, not standing up for us when they see attacks against us. I very specifically address the murders of Black transgender women um, and how afraid many of us are to speak up against this. But this is a form of dehumanization. And if we're against dehumanization, we must be against it in all of its forms. So I address the need for supports around domestic violence. And places that we can call or places we can go that don't involve police, that don't involve those who have in so many ways hurt our community, but allow us others who allow us options for healing where we have counselors we can speak to. I speak to the importance of mental health um, and how unfortunately right now, you know, it's even difficult to become a therapist. It's a very classist system. You have to be able to do several hours unpaid. And most people can't do that. And there's a reason that there's underrepresentation of people of color um, who are therapists. And it's something that I think is really crucial. Having the support, we are all dealing with trauma in very different ways. And unfortunately, men have been taught several ideas of toxic masculinity where then black women are becoming the victims over and over again of their lack of healing. And I address that. Um, the next layer, there's so much I could say, is more in terms of like a societal national level in terms of policy, because I think it's one thing to say to women and people do this quite often, you know, might say, what advice do you have for other women? I think that advice is less important than what I think an entire nation needs to do because it's not on us as much as I might feel empowered or I might say I'm not going to stand for this, but there's nothing in place to keep something from happening to me, then there's only so much I can do on my own. So in terms of national policy, one is I believe that there's a need for universal basic income. I think that there should be a base level of human dignity met when it comes to having money 
for, to provide, especially in a nation where we don't have universal health care. We don't have these things that other countries do. And so we need to think about something that Black women have been saying for years, and Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. also said, money is tied to all of this. If we can meet our basic needs, there's a lot more that we can do, and we can meet the dignity um, of each human being in our nation. And then I think about the need for universal child care. It's something that happens a lot in Scandinavian nations, for instance, where parents are given parental leave, sometimes up to two years, and then by the time they're going back to work and they've been paid this entire time, and again, still treated as human beings, they then have children who go into a universal preschool system. It is a, abnormal to have a country where it's not guaranteed that your child will have somewhere to go when you might want to go back to work or when you might want to maybe pursue another degree or God forbid you want to breathe for a second and have a moment to rest. Um, there needs to be more support for how we raise our children that makes it more equitable across the board. And this is one of the things that came up with the pandemic, why so many women of color left the workforce. There are not systems in place to take care of our children. So from the beginning of life, we have children who are neglected and there's really no other choice. If it's either I need to make money for my family or I need to be here to look at them, what do we do? So those there's are questions I obvious, obviously I address mass incarceration. Um, the fact that black women are the ones who are having to pay for a system that incarcerates us and our loved ones is really sick, but so much of it, so much of our money goes into it, whether that's with the cash bail system, whether that's with like paying for the needs of people who are behind bars. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's very systemic in terms of keeping people in poverty. So all of these stories, when we're talking about Louise Halberton Burtis, it's so that people can now think about centering Black women when we think about policy and when we think about why we might say things like we need to end mass incarceration or we need to end the cash bail system or we need to address gun laws that could have avoided not only Malcolm X's death, but also Martin Luther King Jr.'s death, as well as Alberta King's. She was assassinated in her own church, shot in the back. We need to think of all of these things that are happening nationally. And if we center Black women, we're going to come up with a lot more ideas that are inclusive and intentional, and I believe could actually move the needle forward. Thank you. Um, we have another question that says, how did these mothers relate to the fathers of their children? Did you find the father's roles to be less significant than the mother's? Oh, definitely not. I mean, in terms of the fathers, and I should say, I'm not in any way trying to erase or replace the men in this story. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's room enough to celebrate everybody who mattered in these lives and in, in our history, you know, and that's really a point I'm making. We've made it so entirely male that we've missed huge parts of the puzzle. And I believe we can just fill the puzzle more and there's no need to kind of put one above the other or anything like that. Um, but I will say with all three of the men in terms of the fathers of the sons and the husbands of the mothers, they are much more celebrated in history. Um, if you're a fan of Martin Luther King Jr., you've probably heard of Martin Luther King Sr. And you probably assumed that because he was a reverend. This is where Martin Luther Jr. got it from. But the reality is even Martin Luther King Sr. was aware that he couldn't have been who he was without his wife. And this is just fact. It's not even how we kind of say it all about our partners, like this is my better half and whatever. With them, it's really like <laughs> very tangible. When he met her, he was considered illiterate. He didn't have the same um, access to privilege that she did. He didn't have the same access to education. And so she had a college degree already. Um, he's considered illiterate. And she says, you know, I'm falling in love with you, but you're not an educated man. And it's really important for us as a family to be educated. And so all the men in her family go to Morehouse, the women go to Spelman, this is their tradition. Um, again, this is MLK Jr.'s maternal lineage. It's important to recognize that. And her parents are the leaders of Ebenezer Baptist Church. It's not his parents, it's her parents. So when they get married, she helps him get into Morehouse. She is an educator, um, and she trains him through his college degree. So he goes from being somebody who really can't read and write to a couple years later graduating from Morehouse and then becoming the Reverend of Ebenezer Baptist Church because when her father passes away and he's kind of coming to the end of his life, she advocates for her husband to be the next person in line. So 
you know, it's like, and Reverend Martin Luther King Sr. was so aware of this. Um, and so they re their relationship is beautiful. It's something that is really this mutual support. They're building on each other's experiences. And this is how they raise their children. Um, when we think about Louise Little, um, sorry, Earl Little is her husband. And if you're a fan of Malcolm X, you've most likely heard that Earl Little was also an activist. A lot of people are aware of that, but no one was talking about the fact that Louise Little was, and they met as activists. They came together because they were in a meeting, in a Marcus Garvey meeting. That's where they fell in love with each other because they were both so bold. And they were noticed by Marcus Garvey because they were a couple that was willing to speak very bravely. Um, and they were sent intentionally to places to further incite this revolutionary spirit. So that's how they even came together. And in all three of the marriages, actually, the women are better educated than the husbands are. And they use this education to help their husband's passions, to help their husbands on their journey. Um, and again, it's this kind of mutual support between them. There's some issues that arise in this marriage where Earl Little is more aggressive and easy to anger. Um, and Louise Little kind of fights him against that because again, she's this proud Garveyite who doesn't take crap from anybody, including her own husband. And so they kind of have this kind of tentious or a, a relationship filled with tension. Um, in addition to the fact that they're pursued constantly by the KKK, of course, that's going to cause some issues in their own marriage. But I'll leave that there. There's a lot more that we can say about that. And then with um, James Baldwin, if you're a fan of James Baldwin, you've most likely heard of his abusive stepfather, David Baldwin, but didn't hear about the mother who day in and day out wrapped her child in love and really encouraged him to write and encouraged him on his journey and even stood up to her abusive husband and said he will write he will go see plays um, when his stepfather was very much against this um, but we also learn that David Baldwin was experiencing mental health issues he didn't have any supports around him somebody he could go to to say I feel anger I feel like I'm being attacked day in and day out as a black male I feel like I'm not given the opportunity to provide for my family in the way that I want to so this is not in any way to excuse his behavior but again, for us to understand history a little bit better um, and how Burtis counters this constant pain that he's causing for their children. And they have nine children together um, and she finds ways to make sure her kids still thrive and still value their education and still kind of move forward on their, on their path. And so all of her children were always in awe of her ability to do that. So that gives a little bit more context, but I definitely don't think the men should be erased. I think parents influence their children and that's the story <laughs> that I'm trying to prove. No, it's funny. I, I teach at University of Massachusetts Amherst where James Baldwin taught for several years. Um, and so one of the classes I teach the history civil rights movement was James Baldwin's class. So I have inherited that. And the many things that I've heard about him since working there is how much he spoke about his mother and his relationship with his mother and how close they were, um, which you know, I think some, when I tell this story to my students, some of them find surprising given um, homophobia in the mid 20th century. And yet they still seem to remain quite close. And you note this in your book as well, um, which I was very pleased to see and read about. Yeah, so it was interesting. I felt in many ways that Burtis must have been ahead of her time because yes. she just doesn't comment on it at mm -hmm. all, which in my mind seems almost more revolutionary because that's more of a modern thing that we're doing now where you know our queer loved ones are saying why do I have to have a moment where I come out and have you know like do do straight people have to do this no like it's a further kind of distancing thing um and if they want to come out that's wonderful but if they don't want to there doesn't need to be this big reveal and it's something that seemed to be the case with with James and his mom she never commented on it and it's something that you know she would have if she was concerned she did write about things she was concerned about. They have these letters back and forth where she's concerned about his drinking and concerned that he cusses <laughs> sometimes. Um, and she's like, you need to take care of yourself and like you need to like go to sleep at normal hours. Um, so she she would have said something and she because of how close they were, he introduces her to everybody who matters to him, his friends, his loved ones, um, his partners. He brings them to the house when he can, you know, obviously not the ones who are in France, but they were open with each other and he clearly wasn't hiding who he was and so I really see her as being ahead of her time. Mm -hmm. I gonna say though the letters too you have a letter where you quote from Martin Luther King as Jr. asking for chicken <laughs> yeah. um, from his mother in the letter and I thought 
See, these are those moments that also humanize civil rights leaders in a way that have been so glorified and even sometimes sanitized for political reasons. Yeah. Um, and so I really appreciated that as well. I know. I love the part where he is like a jokester when he's a kid and likes to scare people. He'll put like Alberta's yeah. like furs on the stick and will like stick them out as people walk by. You know, it's a reminder. Yeah, they are people. And we forget that even to this day and the way we kind of go back and objectify them and don't really let these men rest in peace. It's constantly, what's the next scandal we're going to find out about the three of them. But they're human beings with family members who are still alive, who remember what it was like for them to be taken away, their children. And it's just awful. And I think hopefully the book not only returns humanity to these three women, but does so for three, these three leaders as well. Yeah. Thank you. So I know that up we have up next is you're going to read a few passages. Oh, yes. I almost yes. forgot. <laughs> I'm very excited about this. Um, awesome. Okay, this one is on page 198. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Okay. This is from the chapter titled The Circumstances <clears throat> of Our Death. Louise, Alberta, and Burtis were committed to helping their children find their own paths and giving them the tools to pursue the rights they deserved. In each of them, we find a manual on how to survive and persist in a country that stacks all the odds against you. We also see that the world is changeable and waiting on our instruction. Malcolm X's quote at the beginning of this chapter points to the ways in which a mother's lessons are the ones that will determine the trajectory of her child's life and that child's contributions to the world. In a Black mother's teachings lies a world beyond what currently exists. These lessons defy laws that say you are less than. They peek into the future and assure us there are other possibilities, and they make it clear that we are the ones who will usher in the change. The lives of Louise, Alberta, and Burtis also celebrate the diversity of Black womanhood. All had different approaches to survival and their definitions of what it meant for each of them and their family members to thrive. For Alberta, fulfillment for herself and her children rested completely in their Christian faith and was paired with their pursuit of education in order to better their own situation as well as that, as well as that of their larger community. For Louise, Surviving meant never allowing fear to keep you from speaking the full truth, never being afraid of what you might lose in the fight for what was right. For Burtis, living life to the fullest centered around being able to find love and joy for yourself, no matter how hard others tried to take it away from you. I'll just read that one since we're coming close on time. <laughs> Well, uh, Anna and Tracy, I, I really want to thank you for a wonderful conversation. Uh, this was just fantastic and, and, and beyond my expectations. Uh, I did just want to close with a brief farewell. I want to remind folks you'll be receiving an email from me tomorrow morning with a link to a feedback survey. Please let, let us know what you thought of tonight's event. Happy to pass along um, uh, any notes to both uh, Tracy and Anna. Uh, in addition, in that email will be a link to uh, purchase the book from our bookstore partner, um, Wellesley Books, and it'll be autographed copies and 10% of each sale will benefit all of tonight's participating libraries. And finally, hopefully I don't fumble this, uh, I did want to announce our next um, uh, big virtual program in our uh, diversity um, uh, uh, series here uh, on, let me get the date right, on Saturday, April 17th at 6.30, so Saturday at 6.30, kind of a strange time, but we are having uh, Nick Stone, who is the best-selling author of Dear Martin and Dear Justice. Uh, she'll be with us to discuss uh, both of those books. And uh, she'll be speaking also in general uh, how fiction has been used to raise social awareness, challenge the status quo, and make change. Uh, audience members will be inspired to tap their own wells of creativity for the sake of resistance. And uh, information on that program will also be in the email tomorrow morning. 
And with that, I want to thank uh, the 100 plus who are watching on Zoom. And I believe we had another uh, dozen or two on Facebook. Uh, uh, once again, Tracy and Anna, thanks again. Any last words, Tracy? I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have any? Oh, no, I just wanted to thank Anna for writing a fabulous book and for spending some time having a talk with me today. It was a pleasant, it was a good surprise when someone when Robert contacted me five days ago. So <laughs> thank pleased. you so much, Tracy. I cannot believe you had such great questions after five days. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you everybody thank you. for watching. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful job folks. And I'll be uh, ending the zoom in about uh, 10 seconds here. Thanks okay. again. Bye. Bye. Bye.